president of LAI International. Thank you so much for coming today. We want to extend our thanks to the Phoenix LAI chapter that originally put on this program and through the programming efforts of the ad hoc program committee led by Larry Lund. We have co-opted this program from Phoenix to share with many of you across the world regarding COVID and its effect on real estate and opening offices. And we have a panel of experts today. who are gonna be providing us some insights as we navigate new COVID waters. At this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to Marian Zapata Rosa, and she's going to lead off and introduce our panel. Marian? Thank you, Sheila. I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon. I'm a partner with the law firm of Snell and Wilmer, and I will be serving as today's moderator. It's my pleasure to introduce our fellow panelists, beginning with Bob Mulhern, who is a senior managing director of Colliers International, a full service commercial development real estate firm. Bob, in his capacity as senior managing director, manages the operations of the Phoenix and Scottsdale offices, and he's responsible for overseeing more than 100 employees and staff. Bob has more than 30 years of experience in this industry, and he is regarded as a well-respected veteran. In the past, Bob has been recognized as one of Phoenix's most admired leaders, and outside of his professional capacity, Bob works on, and serves on many boards, including a current leadership role that he has on the board of Great Hearts Charter Schools. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce to you Bobby George. Bobby George is a principal architect with Decker Parrish Sabatini. He brings more than 20 years of experience to his field with a focus in the healthcare design space and broad experience in architecture generally. Bobby is a LEED certified professional and a member of the American Institute of Architects. Bobby, thank you for joining us. Thank you and for having me. And then finally, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my fellow partner from the law firm of Snell and Wilmer, Josh Woodard. Josh is a partner in our labor and employment group. He has extensive litigation experience litiga litigating um, all types of employment matters, including wage and hour class actions, restrictive covenant actions, and employment agreement disputes. Josh also uh, does quite a bit of training and presenting on areas uh, including harassment, leadership, and HR management. And Josh has been recognized as one of the best uh, attorneys in America in the employment management side for the last four years. Josh and I also are members of the Snell and Wilmer Coronavirus Response Team, which is an interdisciplinary team of attorneys advising clients on the complex legal issues they've had to face as a result of this pandemic. So welcome to all of the panelists. A pleasure to have all of you with us today and we're grateful for your participation. For the benefit of the audience, we're going to start by having the panelists share with us what type of work they have been doing as a result of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, but also want to invite the audience to the extent that you have any specific questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit those via the chat feature and we will try to get to those questions as we go along. So uh, let's begin with Josh. Josh, share with us a little bit about the type of work that you have been doing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, thank you so much, Marian. I'd be pleased to. So, you know, at mid-March, when the push to move home related to COVID-19 hit, I really kicked in, and, and you know, Mary and you were right there side by side with me, of course, we really kicked into helping employers figure out how best to do that and to deal at that time with some government restrictions. And it, th these are gonna come into play as those government restrictions over the months have morphed and tweaked a little bit, but some industries are still dealing with those, and Mary and we'll chat about that in a little bit. But in terms of, really helping employers. It, the first was to navigate those government restrictions. And then unfortunately, we moved into a phase of furloughs, some WARN Act issues and termination issues. And that was really a hard uh, spot for our clients to be in and, and, and generally all industries to be in because, you know, 
our clients certainly aren't unique to that. And a lot of employers were faced with, look, we can't work or we don't have enough work. And they had to push employees out. And then the new federal legislation came along. And again, we'll talk about some of those nuances here in a little bit, Marion, but the new federal legislation came along and then employers had to navigate that from the new paid sick leave to the new childcare leave. And so that was a big push of, uh, of help that we were, we were um, advising clients on. And now it's really transition into, okay, how do we get employees back to work? And I know that's the focus of this seminar. So we've really seen an evolution throughout the course of COVID about one, pushing employees out and now pulling them back in and how to do that responsibly, legally, and safely. Um, and so certainly uh, so happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bobby, tell us a little bit about the perspective that you bring and what you have been focusing on as a result of that pandemic in the uh, architecture space. Yeah, so, so really we were fortunate enough when, when the pandemic really hit, uh, we had had you know, two years prior put, put forth a disaster recovery business continuity plan. So we had planned for a pandemic a couple of years ago. And so when we were all forced to go home, we were literally turned off the lights in the building and 200 and something people started working from home the next day and we didn't lose any productivity. So it really allowed us to jump right into the space of, you know, one coming up with what was our plan as a corporation to bring people back to the office. How does that look? But then also how we help our clients with the, with the same questions that we had. So we were using our building as really a test case, kind of a learning curve of how you get there, what are the best practices, how do you do it? Uh, and so we have multiple different types of clients from you know, large government clients to, to smaller you know, law offices and other things of people, you know, what does it feel like to bring people back to the office? And so we've created a, a process that we call the right things in, the right things out, which is really comes up with a checklist that has to do with four main factors that uh, really revolve around the physical environment uh, kind of behavioral factors of all the people coming in. What are the policies you create? And then the communications to how you communicate that to everybody. Uh, so we really see a wide range of clients. You know, some people that are just completely lost. They're like, we have no idea how to do this. So we come in and help them create the communication plan. You know, what are the policies you're going to do? What are the changes to your physical environment? And then we've got other people that have done a great job getting there that really just want us to come in as kind of a second check of, will you come in and see what we missed? What can we, what have we done right? What have we done wrong? What suggestions could you make? And so uh, again, this is a, such a crazy time and it's definitely not a one size fits all for any of the organization. And Bob, um, to follow up with that, you actually have a very unique perspective in terms of the um, operations at Collier since the pandemic has hit. Tell us a little bit about that from your perspective. Sure. So in, in Phoenix, because Collier is all over the world, obviously, and all over the U.S., so uh, different offices had different requirements or things that happened. But in Phoenix, we were able to and decided to stay open. So uh, so we were open uh, every day that there was, you know, work days. At the same time, our 100 plus or minus workforce was as middle, little as 10 people some days and as high as 50 others through this through this pandemic. And along the way, uh, early on, very little direction uh, from HR uh, as that caught up, lots of changes within the office. So my perspective will be the, really the practical side. What did we see when in our complex, which is a big complex, there was a, a reported case? What happens when we had the first case in the office? You know, and just how do people respond to all that? And then, and then the same question is, so uh, since our focus is getting people back, well, we still have a lot of people that I haven't seen for, you know, since mid-March. And so there are a lot of, uh, of decisions to be made there on how to successfully bring them back. So those will come up over the, the conversation. And so uh, let's jump really into the meat of today's conversation, which is what are some of the essential steps or priorities businesses need to be putting into place to ensure that they are taking appropriate steps to reopen or to continue operations as we move forward. Bobby? 
Yeah, so a lot of the things specifically that, that we've done, uh, and again, I'll talk a lot about us as a personal organization, and then a lot of the same things that we suggest to our clients doing of, of really how do you look at the, you know, the regulatory environment of where you're at. You know, we have offices in three different states. Two of the states are, are very much open, and one of the states that we're in where our main office is is still really closed down. And so we're limited to, you know, a maximum of 25% occupancy in our space. So if we've done our phase one opening, you know, we kind of have to look at our, our business as a whole of where are we going to do that. So we put in tools uh, in place. So as, as our employees start to come into the office, uh, you know, first and foremost, we'd like people to do their, their, their check at home, you know, check your temperature before you even come to the office. But uh, once you get to the office, we've used some uh, technology tools to help us out that we suggest to all the other folks of, you know, a, a, a an app or a web interface to come on to, you know, basically do a, a basic health screening of, hey, do I have a cough? Do I have a fever? Have I been on, on an airplane in the past 14 days? That's one of the things of our policies that we do. If you've traveled by air, you need to self-quarantine for 14 days and not come into the office, which is why I'm at home today as opposed to in the office. Um, and so then again, you know, we, we have a, a, a temperature screening at the front door, but it, it's for us, and we were trying to be very careful, and I think Josh will probably have a little bit to say about this later on, of, you know, that's just a, a display for the person's information that's right there. We want to be very careful. We're not storing any of that information or keeping any of the, the health data. It's really just a check. And then we use a, a, an electronic in and out board. Uh, just to know who was in the office at any time. So one, we can make sure we're complying with the, you know, if we have a 25% maximum capacity in our office that we're not exceeding that. And we have a whole team that monitors that and lets us know. And, and so if we're pushing close to that, well, it, the, the app will actually tell you when you try to log in that, hey, we've reached the maximum amount of people in the office, you can't come in. So uh, it's just a really interesting, and then you get into the whole physical environment of social distancing, trying to keep distance between people. Do you wear masks? Do you not wear masks? Uh, you know, it's across the board of, you know, if you have private offices, you, if you're in your office, you don't have to have it on, but public areas you do. And, you know, some of our offices, like here in Phoenix, is a wide open floor plan. So really, if you're in the office, you really need to to be wearing a mask all the time. So we have a lot of people that just aren't comfortable. So they, they choose to work from home. And, you know, we've just extended our, uh, you know, work from home until the end of the year. And we'll see where it goes from there because we just want to leave it wide open for people to feel comfortable coming to the office or not. Thank you, Bobby. And Josh, uh, many of the priorities that Bobby shared that are being implemented in his workplace, as we know from a legal perspective, can present exposure or risk to businesses if they're not being handled appropriately. Tell us a little bit about some of the legal aspects involved with um, some of those priorities or essential um, essentials for opening the business. Yeah, absolutely. And Bobby, I'm so glad you mentioned the temperature check. So let's start there because I think that triggers a couple legal possible areas of exposure. And the first, which you, you aptly mentioned, when you take a temperature check, and a lot of employers are doing so, our recommendation has been to not document what the results of that temperature check are. So in other words, if you have uh, a, a little, um, you know, LED or laser temperature check, you need to have the person look at the display, but not write it down, not record it, not email it, don't text it, don't put it on a napkin with a crayon. And the reason is because OSHA, once you record a temperature, you have to keep it for 30 years. That's three zero. So, we recommend don't do it. Obviously have the person check and if somebody's registering a temperature that's over the threshold and that tends, I, I've seen it anywhere between 99.5 and like 100.4. And so there's a kind of range and um, the CDC, um, that kind of changes from time to time. I think the conservative approach is to take 99.5 and if anyone's over that, then you don't allow them in. But if that's the case, just look at the thermometer and that's it. Don't record it anywhere. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Bobby. The other thing that gets triggered, and think of like big organizations where everyone's showing up at the same time and you have to wait in a line, for example, 
to do some wellness check or a temperature check or go through a series of questions. And if, if people are waiting around to do that, and that's a gateway in order to get to work, well, we need to really think carefully about whether that's compensable time or not. And so to take an extreme example, if you're Amazon or Apple or Intel or some gigantic organization, we need to be cognizant of that to the extent that hourly non-exempt employees are standing in line waiting to get in, we might want, need to track that time and pay for it. The other interesting thing that has come up that not a lot of employers are cognizant of, but we've looked into this issue to see if there's any guidance from the federal standpoint, and there's not. And here's the issue. If, for example, employers are having employees take their temperature at home, even before they travel to work, or to complete a wellness check at home on an app, for example, or to log in a computer at home, the question becomes, does their daily hourly clock start then, in which case their commute is compensable time? Because once you start the clock in a day, it's going to continue. Or is that considered de minimis work and not sufficiently related to their integral duties where it doesn't start? Again, there's no crystal clear answer to that, but some possible tips to mitigate that legal exposure from an FLSA standpoint, the Fair Labor Standards Act, is to require those temperature checks and wellness checks. Ideally, you would want to do that after they clock in for the day, because then it's not a problem because you're already paying them for that. To the extent you do it before they come in the door, maybe employers want to set up and say, hey, Josh, glad you, you completed that in the lobby. Now I'm checked in five minutes later. Maybe we, we reverse the clock a little bit to capture that time it took for me to engage in those wellness checks or temperature checks. And so just be cognizant of that. And if you haven't thought through those FLSA issues, it would be a great opportunity to you know, seek out counsel just to make sure that you minimize that FLSA exposure. And you know, those are just primed for class actions when you get those sorts of things wrong. So I would be cautious about that. And a few other things, Marion, but I'll kick it back to you until you circle back to me. Oh, absolutely. So we have received a couple of questions through the live chat and I'm going to um, punt these Bob, your way, and I'll consolidate some of these, which is um, for your organization that largely remained open, um, how have you managed that from a leadership perspective in terms of making all employees feel safe? And, and what, uh, what have you gauged in terms of where your employees are in uh, their own beliefs about the pandemic? I'm, I'm sure there's quite a spectrum yeah. of, of thoughts. So the first thing we did was make sure everybody could work from home. So if they didn't have the right setup, we set them up. If they had it already, we have a lot of brokers, they were set up, we, we did that. Then we actually said, we would encourage you to work from home. No one's required to come in, but we're gonna leave the front doors open. You gotta use your fob to get in. And if you come through the front doors, there's some, some rules you need to follow and those rules have changed over time. And what we have found, uh, and some of our offices didn't have that option because they were required to shut down by the, by the state, right? So what we found is that the, the freedom to come in in itself, I think has been a, a, a significant morale booster uh, because we have been very transparent with information. Uh, so I remember we were having 30 and 40 people come in. I sent an email out because we hear from the complex that somebody in an adjacent building, you know, uh, had uh, tested positive for COVID. All of a sudden, four or five people didn't come in the next day that had been coming in. And then there was one in the building and all of a sudden they went down further. And then, and then uh, there's actually someone had come in the office uh, and left uh, and it had been 10 days or something like that. But each of these, each of these iterations, uh, different people made different decisions uh, and we com we communicated to them with how we 
cleaned and what our process was and committed to keeping them informed. And so there are some employees that I have still haven't seen, like I said, since mid-March, and there's some I've seen almost every day. I only live a mile from the office. Uh, over the summer, counting college students, we had five people home plus my wife, so it was much better for me to go to the office <laughs> to work. So I was in the office almost every day for part of the day, and so I got to see who was here, and people would wander in and just say, hey, I just want to thank you for giving us the option to come in. And then I would talk to somebody who, who hadn't come in at all, and they would say, thank you that we weren't required, you're not requiring us to come in. So our, our theme has been, you know, let, at this point, let adults make adult decisions because they know all these things. And, and some of the things Josh will probably hit on later is, you know, there's going to be a point where, you know, they, there are certain things we can't require people to do because there might be certain dangers or things. And it's even hard to ask some of these questions. But for us at this point, it's been, look, if you want to come in, we're here. And uh, I think there was a question on the productivity. I mean, our office is significantly more productive than many of our fellow offices around the country that had to close down because people could come in, internet's more uh, reliable. Um, the, we, the people from the uh, production center uh, felt comfortable coming in because they kind of work in their own big old space. And so people were able to come in and get packages done and things out. And so it's, it's been really good. Uh, and, uh, and so far, and again, as we have phases too, just like I know companies will have, and those have come out. As we move to the next phases, at some point, again, there's going to be the, um, the, the, the phase says everyone is you know, back in the office. And so I'm sure we'll talk about what that means as we go. But, but it's, been, it's been really interesting for me to see how this works. And, and again, people that are grateful to come in and people who are grateful they don't have to come in. Right. So, Bobby, I think you have a little bit of an uh, interesting perspective as well on what productivity has looked like for different individuals at your firm. You want to share a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I think the, the thing that we, we've learned more than anything, and I think for, for many years, I've always been very questioning of this work from home kind of a thing. Just, I, I didn't think people would be productive being at home. And, uh, you know, so overnight, we shouldn't send everybody home. And uh, the time from when we sent people home until now, still, our, our firm is the most productive we have ever been. And it's just been dumbfounding to me to see how well people have worked and collaborated over uh, the Zoom calls and everything else. But again, we're seeing, uh, we're starting to see some of that come down. And again, I, I, I think it's, uh, we, we're seeing a very bad blurring of work-life balance. So when you're at home, you know, I found that I'm working way more than I ever did because it's right here. Uh, and, you know, other people are doing the same thing, that it's just so easy to continue to work when you're right at home. And so we've seen our productivity go up. Uh, but the one, one kind of demographic that's really had a hard time with this are our parents with young kids. Uh, you know, it's like they're, they're trying to keep their kids busy doing school all day long, and then they're trying to work at night. And, you know, you get on Zoom calls with these folks, and they've got dark circles under their eyes, and they're just worn out. And, you know, when we start the phase one, when we did our phase one opening, you know, we put out a survey and trying to find out who really needed to be in the office. And overwhelmingly, it was that demographic of the parents with the young kids of like, just please get me away from these kids. I need some sanity. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the group that we work with. But, uh, you know, I was very surprised at how, how well we worked throughout the uh, being at home stage. Josh, share with us what to do with people who don't want to return, perhaps because uh, they are in a highly vulnerable population or live with someone who would be considered to be vulnerable? What are the legal ramifications there? Yeah, there's really a couple federal statutes at play in that question, that overlap, that any employer who is really, well, really any size employer for starters, under the latest federal law, which is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, known as the FFCRA. And as I mentioned earlier, that kicked in at the beginning of April. And effectively what that says is there's two major buckets of time available to employees. One of which is if they are sick themselves with COVID or COVID-related symptoms, 
or taking care of somebody who's got COVID or COVID related symptoms, they are entitled to 80 hours or two weeks for a full-time employee of paid leave. Then there's a second bucket under FFCRA, which provides up to 12 weeks of paid time off if somebody needs to care for a child whose school has closed or whose childcare provider is unable to provide childcare due to a COVID related reason. So the first thing that we need to establish when somebody says, you know, hey, uh, uh, Bob, let's say I work for Bob, it says, hey, Bob, I know you want me to come back in, but I can't because of this reason. And so for those employers who are less than 500 employees, both those buckets of new time are available to your employee. And so the first question is if I say, Bob, I can't come in. And I, I, let me just comment um, on Bob's transparency to his workforce, which I absolutely love. I'm a huge fan of being as transparent as possible because I think that creates trust and it pays dividends. So kudos to you, Bob. So I would encourage Bob in that situation to ask Josh in my hypothetical, hey, Josh, what's going on? Why can't you come in? Let's find out why that's the case. If it falls within one of those protected reasons, then fine, Bob's gonna deal with it. But there's other situations. Let's say, for example, that I've already taken my 80 hours of paid new COVID time, and then Bob says, hey, Josh, come in. And I say, well, I can't because I have a disability and I need a reasonable accommodation. Well, that could take a bunch of different flavors under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is the second federal law that we need to be cognizant of. Which Bob might say, well, tell me what's going on and what accommodations, Josh, do you need so you can perform the essential functions of your position? And I might say, you know, I'm particularly susceptible to COVID. I've got some underlying health issues. Let's say I'm going under chemotherapy, uh, radiation and Bob might say, look, Josh, as a reasonable accommodation, I'm gonna, I, I get we're open up, but I'm going to allow you to work from home. And that might be perfectly reasonable for Bob to do. But the point is, we have to first look at the FFCRA. We also have to look under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, to figure out what can Bob do and should do and what am I supposed to do and what should I do to meet the essential functions of my position? But if that's not enough, we have to look at the old traditional FMLA because that might provide another availability for people to take time away from work. And that applies to employers with 50 or more employees inside a 75 mile radius. And effectively what that says is if the employee is dealing with a serious health condition, or is caring for somebody with a serious health condition, whether a spouse, a parent, or a, a child, they're entitled to up to 12 weeks of unpaid time off. So back to my hypothetical, Bob opens up his office, he says, Josh, hey, we'll see you Monday. And I say, well, wait a minute, I, I'm taking care of not a COVID person, but my aging parents need some help. And so Bob might say, okay, well, Josh, if your aging parents have a serious, serious health condition, then you might be entitled to FMLA leave. And so he gives me the FMLA paperwork, in which case I might be out of work. And so I wish there were a one size fits all, Marion. Unfortunately, there's not. When people say, I don't want to, or I can't come to work, we have to get to those nuances of, again, all those three acts. And I hate to be an alphabet soup, but just so it's out there, it's that FFCRA, the ADA, as well as FMLA. We have to look at each individual to see, can we force them back in or can we not? Let me just end real quickly. There have been situations where somebody does not fall within one of those buckets. They're not dealing with COVID or they're not caring for someone. They don't have a kid who needs childcare support. They're not disabled. They just are fearful of coming in and they're not particularly vulnerable to catching it, they just don't want to come back to work. In those situations, I would advise people to contact counsel just to make sure, but in those situations, let's say I'm that guy, 
Bob could say, you know what, Josh, we need you in here. And if I continue to refuse and I don't fall within one of those protected classes, and there's a whole bunch of them, Bob can just say, you know what, Josh, we don't have a job for you. And so there can be those situations, but I say that with some extreme caution because there are so many exceptions to that rule. But look, we've seen it and it happens and there are those occasions where, look, this isn't the place for you and, and we're gonna let you go. But again, with some caution. A, a, a thought on that and I know, uh, you know what, to Bobby's comments earlier, we've had some people who have gone home and have not missed uh, an ounce of productivity. Um, and they're happy there and they're doing well there. So we've already, we're already talking about, hey, when we say come back, there are certain people that have struggled being away, you know, that are supporting uh, a service here. And most of those we've, we've called them or, 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 had, or met with them and said, look, you know, if you, if you can't do this from home, then we're gonna need you to come in you don't really want to come in yet. So how do we help you be more productive? But uh, I think we're not going to try to, uh, again, like everything else, have a one size fits all. If there was no reason not to come in and somebody's inordinately productive at home, I mean, we, and, and someone says, well, how come they don't have to come in and I do? Uh, I think we're going to be able to say, look, they, this works for them and it's not working for you. And so there's going to be a lot of moving parts to that because you know our, our we think we have very good employees as you guys know there's it's hard to find and keep good talent so we want to keep all that as best we can but there'll be there'll be a lot of decisions to make and for some people it'll ultimately be well this is where the job is um and that's really you know uh it'll be interesting when that comes now that's coming from the managing director right hr always has a say on this <laughs> before I, you know, that's my position on it. But, you know, we're part of a big company. So there, there always is a whole, you know, a lot of things Josh is talking about that come with it. But I think the, the good news is, is we're not trying to make those decisions now, but we're very cognizant that those decisions and conversations are on their way. And the starting point really in this conversation is ensuring that you have complied with all of the safety requirements and all of the guidance that applies to you based on the industry that you're in and the jurisdiction that you're in so that um, employees can't raise concerns about the workplace not being safe and that being the reason why they don't want to come back. We've certainly seen an uptick in class action and other litigation making those types of uh, raising those types of allegations against companies nationwide that the workplace is not a safe environment for employees to return so that of course is the starting point and along those lines we received a question about ac uh, units and so i'm going to punt this one to bobby so uh, the question is how about air handling systems how accurate are the promises made by manufacturers or for that matter building operators i'm no expert but I imagine how AC and heating systems are maintained, set up, that that would be essential to perform uh, to performing to specification. Bobby, do you have any insight that you can share with that? And then I'm going to kick it to Josh next to talk to us about employee waivers, liability waivers. Absolutely. So, so we've seen part of this physical environment changes that we're looking at are, you know, is there a way to modify, you know, mechanical systems to be safer? You know, there's things like, you know, ionized air filters that you can use or even UV light that, you know, sanitizes the air coming through. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the promises that are being made, you know, I, I'm a bit skeptical of do they actually meet uh, what they need to do. Uh, but again, we, we see this moving. There was a, a, a movement really starting in the office environment before COVID hit, which was really having to do with wellness. And so we, we work with the well building standard a lot. And it's really how do you create a more healthy environment for your employees to be. And it was really all about, you know, great indoor air quality, quality choices for food, exercise, all of these different things. And we really see that as we start moving into, you know, what is the next generation of the office look like? We really see this well building standard as being something that's going to uh, really jump to the forefront of having uh, what's seen as a healthy environment. Uh, because there's a lot of, you know, older office buildings that we've seen that just don't have a lot of, you know, fresh air intake and how do you clean the filters and do you put HEPA filtration on and 
uh, a lot of it is there's a lot of money that you know can be spent on some of those things that may or may not really be efficient until you really go through and look at um, an overall system performance standpoint and really uh, commissioning those systems to make sure they are performing to the specifications that were put in. But, uh, it's definitely a difficult question. Another one that some businesses may be contemplating, uh, and the question is, what about getting employees to sign a waiver, i.e. that if they come into the office and later get COVID, they can't sue my company for damages. Josh, do you have some thoughts about the enforceability of those types of waivers? Sure. In a nutshell, they're not. <laughs> um, you know, companies do have an obligation under some OSHA standards to create a safe environment in which to work. So you cannot have the employee waive their rights under that and basically say, hey, if you get injured, if you get sick, not my problem, um, employee, it's your problem. It just does not work like that. So in the, and this is unique to the employment context because a lot of times you can get releases and waivers and indemnity provisions in a lot of different contexts. And, and we have really shied away um, because they're, they're just not enforceable, you know, but I will say it, there are some different states with some different rules. This is a very state specific issue. However, if somebody catches COVID, there still has to be a link to, hey, I can prove I was injured or caught COVID or any other disease while at work. That is extraordinarily difficult. Now, I will say over in California, there is a presumption built in that if somebody gets sick, it's presumed they caught it at work, but they have some different mechanisms in California. So again, very state by state specific, but the long and short of it is, Marion, no, we've been shying away and advising clients not to go down that uh, waiver road with employees. A comment so, on uh, on that, and real quick, Josh. I mean, I, I I've kidded our our brokers that we should give California like our our uh, development partner of the year award because they're just driving companies out of out of there with some of their some of their policies and procedures. But it's interesting. What I you know when I didn't have that many people here and I didn't have anybody to boss around, right? I walked around and and actually measured a lot of spaces, and I sent emails to anybody that I thought was when they turned and sat with each other and talked from their desks, that they were going to be six feet plus or minus. And, uh, and, and most of them weren't in the office. And I, and I had this nice email. So look, when you're facing the way you do, you're probably eight feet apart. When you're both facing cybers, you're probably seven. But if you both turn in to talk, you're probably about six foot apart. Do you want us to uh, make some si sort of change to your work environment um, in order to accommodate that. So because a lot of these people are, are their teams and they, and they kind of let each other into that small circle of people they're working with. But we did ask that. And out of the 30 people, which was again, 15 pairs, there were two individuals within a pair that said, you know, I would like a little more space. And so we got a hold of our, you know, our um, uh, systems furniture people and said, look, how do you help us create a little space here? Uh, we also, uh, and, and this is with people not in the office, so we also bought some plexiglass that could hang from the, from the ceiling, and just in case somebody gets back and goes, wow, I mean, I forgot this is a little closer than I thought, so we could put it up within a couple of days so that they can work. So it, it is interesting that, you know, the, our concerns were when we saw the, the 15 different places that would potentially need to be altered that really only two of those pairs were interested in doing that. And again, that's not any type of scientific, you know, obviously sample, but it, it is, I think the employees and our brokers, they've appreciated this, this option to say, yeah, I want something or I don't, I don't want more space because part of our, our synergy is we're not, you know, inordinately far away. So it's a practical point, but it is, I think I would throw again, if you can put it in front of people, before you start making too many decisions, you might find you don't have as many decisions to make as you thought. Bob, I'm glad the Social Republic of California is helping you. So good. <laughs> yeah, that's tremendously, <laughs> tremendously. Another question that has come in from the audience. The question is, what's the risk of having employees come in if the local ordinance could be read to say that they should work from home if possible? 
but the company is considered essential. So it's a situation where the worker could work from home, but the company is considered essential. And so the question is contemplating having them come in. So we are, we in, in the real estate, and I know law too, and I'm not sure, uh, Bobby, how that affects us specifically. I mean, we're considered an essential service. And that's where I say being part of a big company steps in because the company immediately said, we will have no more than 50% occupancy in the space. And they leave it to us to figure that out. And we've never had an issue with that because we have the capacity for, we've, we've never had 50% of the people uh, any given day, much less any given time. But uh, I, do, I do know for us, uh, the, even if I wanted to do that, uh, the company already kind of got ahead of that and said, look, we're, you know, we're going to put that safety feature in and you need to, you need to adhere by it. And I didn't have any issue with it because like I said, letting people make their own decisions, it was a little less than 50% anyway, but uh, that's how it worked in our office at Colliers. Yeah. And I think for, for us, you know, we were considered essential employees and, you know, we could have had everybody stay at the office really if we wanted to, but we really, I mean, we see, you know, our employees are like, you know, outside of our paying clients, our employees are our greatest asset. You know, I really look at it that way. But we want to make sure we're attracting the right people. We're keeping the people that are there. And, you know, some of us may think that, you know, this whole pandemic is, you know, just a bunch of hogwash and it's kind of crazy. And then there's other people at the other end of the spectrum where you know, they're totally fearful. I mean, we did a survey and we had people say, I'm not coming back to the office until there's, you know, a, a uh, antibiotic test, you know, and everybody's had the shot. And uh, we're just kind of like, you know, we don't want to force the issue with people and the fact that I guess we've been really lucky that people have been productive working from home. So uh, it's about respect and trust is, is really where we draw the line on it. So from the, per from the perspective of uh, the legal industry, in our engagements, there's a specific disclaimer that we have no crystal ball and we can't guarantee any results. So we won't hold you to that, Josh and others on the call. But what can you, what insight can you give our panelists in terms of what the future might hold or what the next normal is going to look like and how businesses can try to get ahead of it? Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and start with that. You know, for us that we, we see you know, like it or not, I, I think the office environment as we all knew it is, is no longer. It's not going to be there. And, you know, what does the office of the future really look like and what does it hold? Uh, you know, we see that, you know, likelihood of 25%, maybe more people are going to want to work from home, you know, either part time or full time. And, you know, are we going to be able to support that? And, you know, we're just grappling with you know, what does it look like from a, a space allocation standpoint? I mean, you know, you look at are people going to go to, you know, bigger spaces, a little, as Bob talked about, a little bit where you're not packing as many people in. So, you know, ultimately, we see corporations kind of holding the amount of space they have with maybe less people in there on a rotating basis. Uh, we, we obviously see, you know, well-building standard things coming in, making a healthy environment for people. But, you know, from our standpoint, you know, we don't want to lose this opportunity. You know, we've kind of had a, you know, 10 years of evolution happen in about four months uh, of people accepting electronic submissions for, you know, permit reviews and other things and just being able to do business electronically. And, you know, for us, people working from home, we always were resistant to it. And now, you know, it may be a really good thing. So we all had our, our perceptions change drastically within about four months. And so it's like, how do we leverage that? And how do we innovate our way out of this, uh, you know, kind of conundrum we're in and make the office of the future someplace that is really, really great, that may have a completely different function than it does now, uh, but it's much better. And, it, you know, this, this whole pandemic has forced us to think of, you know, what could we do better and how can we, you know, rapidly, you know, advance. And, And Mary, and I'll jump in from a legal perspective, and it is tough to know what's on the horizon. However, I do think Congress, and this might be rose-colored glasses, but I do think Congress is going to come up with a compromise relief bill 
that will either extend some unemployment benefits uh, for people who have been unable to return to work in, for one reason or another, and or some benefits that would compensate people for going back to work. So I do think there's gonna be some compromise. I did check this morning, they're still battling it out. Who knows, you know, those are our federal dollars not at work, I suppose, but I think it's coming. And so I, I would expect that in the next coming, in the next several weeks, I, I'm obviously crystal ball, like you said, Mary, and it's tough to tell, but yeah, I think in the next three to four weeks, there will be some compromise in Congress. And so that could change the employment landscape a little bit. And of course, the election coming up the first Tuesday in November, um, that will dictate some changes one way or the other in the employment space, depending upon whether the current administration continues or whether there's a changeover. And so we, we certainly can expect some changes uh, once that election hits. Bob, what do you foresee on the horizon? Well, I, I think that you know, I think most companies, rightly so, have talked about phasing, and I, I saw a question on phasing too, and and I think that's the way to go. To say, you know, at at some point, uh, you you can re request or make it available for more people to come in. Now, in our case at Collier's, it has to mean that the building is meeting certain requirements that we are meeting certain requirements, including having the right spacing, that we have the protocol coming in, the masks in the common areas, not using certain areas, all those things. And then, uh, then you get a group of people that know that if, if everyone's sticking to that, that there's, there's a, a better chance to, you know, to come in, feel comfortable and be productive. And then, and then again, at some point, uh, and then there's also the exterior. I mean, there's some, there's some um, local or like in our case, probably Maricopa County type stats that have to be moving in the right direction in order for us to move up a phase. And then we have to apply for that and go in. And I think it's a good process because it gives, it just gives the uh, employees who we all know are so important to us, the, the sense that, that we really are trying to do the right thing. And I like it in Arizona, the governor who says, you know, save lives, save livelihoods. I mean, there are certain people that, that would do want to come back in, but they're not convinced it's safe to come back in yet. And so I do think that that's, again, a combination of all three of those things. They're in a safe building. Uh, we have the right um, uh, protocols in place in the office and the, the, there are certain stats moving in the right direction. Uh, in the county, which right now, of course, those are. So I'd like to think, and then one of the things we can do in phase two, which we can't do now, is we can invite visitors in as long as they go through the protocol of, of wearing the mask, uh, taking their temperature when they come in and, and doing a short little app. And so that would be, you know, when we think that's important, again, we're going to need to make sure everything's in good order to do that. So it's been very interesting to me uh, because again, you guys know brokers. Some of them are like, "Oh, nothing." You know, uh, I'm not afraid of anything. I don't understand why we're doing all this. And then, but they are supported by very talented people who are. Uh, I'm not going to say more commonsensical, but you know, just say, "Look, there's a lot going on here that we can't just uh, be, you know, bravado about." So I'm very encouraged by it because I think for us, it's actually making our culture stronger uh, because the communication is up, the transparency is clear. And when all the dust settles, whatever we've done and decided is going to both attract and repel talent. And I think that, that so far, I'd like to think it's gonna retain the top talent we have and attract some other top talent who really didn't feel that same kind of communication or transparency where they are right now. At least that's my, my hope. And Bob, can I uh, have your thoughts on this probably final question that's come in, which is, um, someone said, one of our panelists said they were in phase one, and I, I think maybe that's the phase that uh, maybe everybody on the panel is on here up in, uh, in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. But the question is, someone said they're in phase one of reopening with no more than 25% occupancy with, I presume, social distancing, mask wearing, et cetera, other requirements. I'm curious what phase two looks like, the same requirements, but up to 50% occupancy. What are, what are those benchmarks? Um, to the extent you have those and um, mm -hmm. can share, what does the phase two benchmark look like for your organization? 
Right, and they've moved a little bit. So initially it was when phase two came in, we could require people to start coming in maybe in, in, in different days so we never exceeded the 50% occupancy. But now in ours, because this hasn't gone away, uh, in phase two, people still are encouraged and allowed to work from home. But again, the biggest difference is, is that they know we've met this full checklist of things we can show them. So maybe people that do want to come back in. And then secondly, we can bring in clients as long as they want to kind of follow the protocol, which right now, you know, nobody comes through the front door unless they work here. So those are the biggest differences for us right now. And there's a follow-up question about what triggers phase two. And I would presume that companies are still looking at the numbers as they come in. And of course, some of the data that's available through the local health departments has a week and a half or a two week lag. Um, those are important numbers that are being factored in. Um, but are, is there a threshold that will trigger phase two that your organization has settled on or is this continuing kind of to be a developing um, plan? You know, it's, well, it's that checklist. Is everybody, is there proper spacing between wherever they work and the person close to them? When you use the copier, is there, a, you know, a, a remote station right there that you can sanitize your hands before using it? Uh, at the water, is there a button you push that is one of those sanitizing, cell sanitizing buttons? All these things, say, look, if all those things aren't met, then you can't come in. If you're, if you're, if the building's not cooperating either, which ours definitely is, and there's, you know, they're not enforcing mask wearing and that, then that would eliminate us. And then the third one is the, is the county um, numbers. And so the good news is, is when phase two comes and we start to encourage people to come back, we can be pretty confident or, or comfortable that we're doing everything we can to give them a safe work environment and one that they, you know, can confidently come back to and participate in. I'll open up the floor now to any final or closing thoughts by our panelists. I will jump in based upon what, you know, Bobby and Bob were talking about in terms of the safety and the reopening. And I will say, and Mary, you've experienced this too, when addressing clients who have had a positive COVID test for one of their employees, that does ripple to um, a lot of concern, pushing people to home who may not have otherwise been home. And so there is quite a disruption. So I've tended to provide perhaps a little bit more conservative advice because we've seen the downsides of when somebody does test positive. So I do like the cautious approach that Bobby and Bob are taking for sure. I think that ultimately will pay dividends, even for those companies who think this is overblown, this is too much of an overreaction, why are we doing this, can't we come back to work? Because not all of your employees may be on the same page, and so I would I would encourage maybe some caution because once you do have a test or two or three that are positive, that's going to change the dynamic of your workforce. And to the extent that we can take those precautions from a building standpoint and a behavior standpoint, which I love, which Bobby mentioned, um, I think that would do employers well. And of course, Marion, from our perspective, mitigate some empl legal employment related risks. Yeah, I think those are great points. And, you know, one of the things that we looked at is, is we took a very cautious, measured approach to this is really is, is about risk management for us. So, you know, if we go to phase two and ultimately phase three, which is bringing everybody back and you're in the office and that happens too soon and we have all of our employees come in and, you know, you know, God forbid someone comes in, has, you know, asymptomatic and start spreading the virus around. And then all of a sudden we have a third of our workforce is really ill and out if we can't meet our uh, project deadlines and our contractual commitments. You know, to us, there, there's a big risk in that. And so, of course, we want to follow the guy. We want to be, you know, very good stewards of the people we're there, but we're also a business. And ultimately, our core is we want to ensure that continuity and, and we just take it as, as a risk management kind of thing. And, you know, so all of, all of our partners, we're all over the board of, you know, who's super cautious, who's afraid, who's not, who thinks it's, you know, all just, uh, you know, kind of a made up event. But, 
you know, ultimately at the end of the day, when it comes down to our employees and the people who really help us out in our business, if we have one person who's just not comfortable and who is a great performer and we want to make sure we keep them, you know, we're going to do what we need to do to, to take care of our folks and really just look at the, the risk of our business and how we go about it. So, so my comment would be uh, that I hope that people got as much out of this as we had a practice run at this and I took some notes and then my operations manager didn't know I was just on it. She would have thought I was a very smart person because I had all these great questions to ask after hearing from Josh and Bobby, but also Marianne and Sheila and b both Sheila's are part of that conversation. And it's just as a reminder that there's a lot more of this than we think, you know, and so it's just constantly, you know, we're, we're not getting too confident about what's going to happen and two weeks, uh, but we are, uh, we're very open to these kind of conversations. So I, I really do hope you guys got out of as much as we did, because I'm telling you, we've actually made a few changes just since our practice uh, call a couple days ago. So I thank the, the panelists for that. Very, very uh, good intuition and insights on how we need to be safe moving forward. Yeah. And just in closing, in terms of what the future may hold, uh, it from a legal perspective, we certainly have seen an increase in claims because businesses are forced to make critically important decisions and they have been since March. And so to the extent that organizations are making the right decisions, prioritizing safety and really valuing their workforce and employees, um, adv uh, seeking the advice of counsel when necessary, we believe that that uh, will put the company in the best position possible to be able to mitigate any legal risk. And unfortunately, businesses that are not making informed decisions and are having missteps along the way or not prioritizing the guidance and the resources that are available to them um, may find themselves embroiled in these class actions that we're seeing on the rise. And so one thing that uh, my fellow panelists and I have agreed is if you have questions that did not get answered over the course of today's panel, we have all agreed to make ourselves available to answer your questions. Please feel free to reach out to us directly after uh, today's presentation. And I just, on behalf of all of us, I wanna thank um, Sheila, for having us participate with your organization today. We certainly enjoyed um, spending this afternoon with you. Sheila? Thank you very much. Um, Marion, Bobby, Bob, and Ross, this has been really great, really informative, and um, I like the fact that Bob learned something over the last couple of days. That makes me very happy. Um, and I also want to send some additional kudos to Bob because he, uh, he does sponsor the Phoenix chapter and uh, provides a uh, some underlying support uh, to keep our chapter running. So we want to thank you for that, Bob. Okay. Um, the session has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So that will be available to anyone and everyone, people that weren't able to join us today. And also, um, Mary Lund and I would love to hear from you about other ideas that you would have uh, for programs because um, LAI is not going to be able to meet in person this year, and we're not sure how much into next year we're not going to be able to meet, particularly since we pick other people from all over the globe at our meetings. So talk about travel restrictions. Uh, it gets really complicated. So um, other ideas that people have about other panels or other panels you'd like to put together, please let us know. You can always reach us at LAI at LAI.org. So thank you again to everybody and uh, be safe. Thanks, you too. Thank, Thank you. you.